46. Psalm chapter 46. At the top of uh, that psalm, it has the words to the chief musician. And you'll remember the psalms are uh, like the hymn book of Israel. And it says here, to the chief musician, a psalm of the sons of Korah, a song for the Alamoth. And it begins in verse 1 here. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, Selah, there is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. Well, if we go about 50 years into the past, due to the insanity and complexity of the problems that our society was enduring 50 years ago, in 1970, a band called The Temptations called Planet Earth a ball of confusion. Troubles around the globe were increasing in many areas of life, and if you go ahead, uh, ahead 31 years after that, from 1970 to 2001, of course, 9-11 occurred. And since then, the evil per perpetrated by humans against one another has continued unabated. The Taliban, Boko Haram, ISIS, beheadings, school shootings, massacres in churches. In fact, the pictures there in the lower right hand on your screen is of the church in South Texas. And those are the church members that were killed by a gunman that invaded that church not very long ago. School shootings, massacres in churches, and shootings at public events like concerts have almost become the norm. In addition, as we're all aware, Awful diseases like SARS and Ebola and now COVID-19 have ravaged people's lives. And now, America, which had the lowest unemployment and the best economy and stock market run in the world just three months ago, is in a fi financial predicament that rivals the Great Depe Depression of the 1930s. So alarming events are occurring with lightning speed both here and abroad and along with it profound uncertainty. And you know what? We are all residents of this ball of confusion. So a couple of extremely important questions before us are these. How are we to process everything that's happening around us? That's question number one. How should we be thinking? And question number two is this, what should we be doing in light of all this? Well, for Psalm, 9, Psalm 46 helps us to answer both of these questions. It gives us critical reminders of what we should be focusing on as well as what we should be doing and what course of action we should be taking. So the title that I've given this morning is called Critical Reminders for Ball of Confusion Residents. See, we're all residents on this ball of confusion. And Psalm 46 gives us these critical reminders, critical reminders for Ball of Confusion Residents. Would you pray with me for just a moment, please? Father, we're so thankful that you love us, that your promises are steadfast and sure, Father. And we're so thankful for the direction you give us through your word, Father. We pray that you'll use this in every one of our lives, Lord, to strengthen us, to settle us, to comfort us, and yes, Lord, even to, to uh, exhort and rebuke us when needed, Lord. We just pray that your word would be mighty, Lord, 
And whether, Lord, those that are listening are believers or not, Lord, we just pray that your Spirit would do his mighty work this very morning, Lord. And, of course, we ask all these things in the name that's above every name, the name of Jesus. Amen. This picture isn't the greatest picture. It's pretty fuzzy, but this is a helicopter view of a $700,000 house on Lake Whitney, which had one of the most breathtaking views that you could ask for. Now, I just used the word had because everything wasn't fine for the owners of this house. Everything was fine, actually, until one day it wasn't. One day the bottom dropped out for them, literally. The cliff their mansion was sitting on disappeared overnight. And because the situation was so dangerous for that family, the house had to be burnt to the ground. It was a total and complete loss for this family. Now when you turn in your Bible to Psalm 46, you and I aren't exactly sure of the troubles that Israel was facing when the psalmist wrote these words. Though, it was highly possible that the nation was uh, in grave danger of being invaded by enemy armies, being overtaken in war. However, even though we don't know exactly what was happening, we do know this. The psalmist was rallying God's people. He was rallying God's people to trust in God when what was happening all around them didn't look good at all. Notice verse 1. In verse 1, God says to his people, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And that brings us to our first lesson this morning about what we're to do and what we're to think in the midst of trouble and confusing circumstances, and it is this. Number one, we must remind ourselves that God is not only our protector. He's a refuge that we could run to. He's not only our protector, but he's also our helper. He's not only a safe shelter that we can hide in for protection, but he's also there to help us when there's no way out of troubles we find ourselves in. He's a very present help in trouble. Now recently in, in one of my messages, I mentioned that God is like a storm shelter, the kind that people spend thousands of dollars on to protect them and their families in case a tornado strikes. Those are incredible things to have when uh, tornadoes are raging all around a city. Now, think about this. God is the ultimate storm shelter. He's the ultimate storm shelter. He is our protection. He is our assistance. He will help us when we're struggling to make it on our own. So he's a shelter we could flee into, and he's also there to give us the help that we need in time of trouble. And you know what? If we're drowning and we can't swim, we're going to cry out for help. We're going to scream, help, and hopefully somebody will come to our rescue. Well, God is like a lifeguard. He's a very present help in trouble, and he specializes in helping people who are in deep trouble. Now, you might ask, how deep? Well, look at verses 2 and 3. Therefore, we will not fear. Since he's our refuge, he's our very present help, we will not fear. When earthquakes come and mountains crumble into the sea, it's kind of what happened to that family's backyard that we just saw. Their entire backyard crumbled down into Lake Whitney. When it's waves, when ocean waves crash and foam and the mountains shake before the surging sea, that's some bad storms. And it's a picture in God's word of utter chaos. A picture of utter chaos. This is a world like ours 
that's crumbling to pieces before our eyes. So many problems, so many heartaches, so many burdens, so much poverty, so much injustice. Yet the psalmist tells God's people, don't fear. God is our safe house. He's our lifeguard. He will protect us and he will help us when there's no way out. You say, Bob, how great is this God you're talking about? Psalm 46 tells us. Look here, verse 1. He's our refuge, he's our strength, and he's our help in time of trouble. Verse 5. He's in the midst of his people. He's right there for them. In verse 5 also, he helps his people so they're not devastated. That's how great he is. Verses 7 and 11, he is always with us. And then in verse 10, he is God and will one day be exalted by every single nation on planet Earth. So first of all, we must remind ourselves that God is powerful. He's not only a safe and strong shelter that we can hide in, but he's also there to help us when it seems like there's no one else to turn to, when there is no way out, seemingly, of our troubles. That's lesson number one. Now there's a second lesson here, though, and this lesson revolves around the godless nations and the corrupt governments that bring so much misery to people on planet Earth. This is in verses 4 through 7. Let's read those verses together. Verse 4. A river brings joy to the city of God, this, our God, the sacred home of the Most High. This is, of course, talking about Jerusalem. God dwells in that city. It cannot be destroyed. From the very break of day, God will protect it. The nations are in chaos. And their kingdoms crumble. God's voice thunders and the earth melts. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. Now, as every one of us know, Israel is a tiny country of a few million people surrounded by millions of people that hate them and want to see them removed from the face of the earth. Israel has always faced this predicament because the Jews are a nation that God has made irrevocable promises to. And Satan wants to eradicate Israel because if he could wipe Israel off, off the face of the globe, there will not be a nation for Jesus to return to. The Word of God says Jesus is going to come back and rescue Israel in the darkest hour of their entire history. But if there's no nation there for him to return to, then God's word is proven to be a lie, and Satan is the winner. But verse 5 tells us that God dwells in the midst of Israel, and just as he has always taken care of Israel when the nations have raged against it, he will take care of us. And that brings us to our second critical reminder about how we are to live and what we are to think in trouble and confusing circumstances. And our second lesson is this. We must remind ourselves that our God is the Lord of heaven's armies and that he is always with us. One time a scholar was asked for the most compelling argument that he could give for the truth and accuracy of God's word. And he said, oh, that's easy. Israel. That's easy. Israel. No matter what battles Israel faced, God would not allow, allow the nation to be obliterated. They have always existed since the time of Abraham, and they always will. God has put his hand on his chosen people. They are the apple of his eye. He took care of them physically, always. In fact, as we read in verses 4 through 7, the city had a river running through it that made life possible 
even when the walls were closed off and they couldn't leave the city, they had a river flowing through that city that God made possible and kept people alive when they had to keep the entire city shut down and protected from the armies that were outside of its walls. So he took care of them physically. Not only that, he took care of them personally. Are you listening to that? He's taking care of you personally. He cares about you. He took care of them personally with his presence and protection. In verse 6, the nations were raging in an uproar against God's people. So what does God do? He intervenes and he defeats those who would come against his people. Now someone may say, Bob, are you saying that the followers of God never die? Israelites, believers in Christ, Christians, they never die at the hands of evil people? No, but what I am saying is this. God has a plan for every single one of our lives, and you and I are invincible until God is through with us. We will never die a day sooner than God intends for us to die if we are walking with him and bringing him honor and glory. That's an amazing, amazing truth. You know, if you go back to 9-11, we referenced it earlier, there was a believer on one of the hijacked planes, and his name was Todd, Todd Beamer. He was a believer who fought the terrorists on the plane that was headed toward Washington, probably to the Capitol building, to fly into the Capitol of the building of the United States of America. But Todd Bieber was on that plane. He had a wife and two children and a baby on the way. And he fought with the terrorists on that plane that eventually flew into a Pennsylvania field at 500 miles an hour. For the last 13 minutes of that flight, Todd Beamer spent some time on one of those phones that was on the back of each of the uh, seats back in those days before cell phones, and they had the phones built into the seats, and he made a call, and he was on a call with, I believe, like a 9-11 operator, and spoke with her. Her name was... Uh, uh, Lisa Jefferson, if I'm remembering correctly. But nonetheless, he talked with her. He told her the predicament. And he asked to pray with her, and they prayed together. And Lisa Jefferson said it was the most awful 13 minutes as she had to listen to the screams and the cries of people just before that plane crashed. But Todd Beamer was a very special man. And after he hung up that phone, he said to several other brave men these famous words that have been made into a movie and all the different uh, things that have been done about 911 since that time. And he said these words, let's roll, let's roll. And he laid down his life along with these others, trying to thwart the hijackers and to save his fellow passengers. You know, because God is our refuge. We are invincible. We are indestructible until he is through with us. God put Todd Beamer on this earth to do his will until that day of 9-11, 2001. And then God brought him to himself. He, Todd Beamer laid down his life and I'm sure the Lord's words to him were, well done, good and faithful servant. You did what I put you on this earth to do. So folks, when the world is in chaos around us, we must remind ourselves, number one, that God is our refuge and our strength and a very present help in time of trouble. We need to remind ourselves, number two, that he's always with us in our problems, and that you and I are invincible. We are indestructible until he's through with us. And finally, number three, we must remind ourselves that we are on the winning team 
no matter how difficult things may get. If you turn to verses 8 through 11, they picture God's future victory over his enemies and his exaltation as God by every nation on earth. Every nation will give God glory. And in verse 8, God is giving us a, the future battle of Armageddon here. Verse 8. Come, see the glorious exploits. It's another way of saying, come and watch God in action. Come see the glorious exploits of the Lord, of Yahweh. See how he brings destruction upon the world. See, God is not going to allow this world to reject him and to belittle him and to use his name in vain forever. One day, God will judge this world in holiness and in righteousness. At Armageddon, the armies of the entire earth will come against Israel, and it will be the worst and most horrible time they'll be going through in their entire history, but Jesus will rescue them. He will descend from heaven, and he will come and defeat all of the armies of this earth. He causes wars, verse 9. This is at the aftermath of his victory. This is the millennial kingdom. Jesus is now the king of the entire earth. He causes wars to end throughout the earth. He breaks the bow and snaps the spear. He burns the shields with fire. There's his victory. So in light of all of this, in verses 10 and 11, God gives some instruction here. Now, uh, scholars are a little bit uh, divided as to whether he's talking to his people here, saying, be still, quit worrying, know that I am God or whether he's talking to the nations of the earth, meaning be still. In other words, uh, you nations of this earth, listen to me. You need to be still. You need to quit fighting against me. But either way, either way, it's important. Because if it's to the nations, they need to do just that. They need to be still. They need to quit fighting against God and rebelling against him. And if it's written to God's people, it's also good because it's telling his people to be still, not to worry, not to fret, and know that he is God. Look at, look at verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. I will be honored by every nation. He didn't say I, I might be honored. No, he said I will be honored. This is going to be happening one day. I will be honored throughout the world. This entire earth will give glory and praise to God. Verse 11, the Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. Now, the story that I'm going to tell you, I've probably told you so many times, you could, you could tell it along with me, but it's such a great story for this part of this message, and I just couldn't resist using it here. But a friend of Pastor Vernon Grounds told him that when he was in seminary many years ago, he and some other guys would go to a local uh, public school gym to play basketball because the seminary that they went to didn't have a gym. And there was a very patient elderly man who would be sitting in the bleachers while they practiced, while they had some pickup games there, and he would be sitting there with his Bible in his hand, and he'd be reading his Bible, and and his friend would look over there and see that janitor holding that Bible and reading it. And he always wondered what he was reading. And uh, if being a seminary student, he might be able to answer some questions that he might have about what he was reading. And so after they were finished playing one night, uh, the Vernon Grounds friend went over to the janitor. And uh, he wanted to find out uh, what he was reading. And so he asked him, he said, uh, say, uh, what are you reading? And the janitor said, the book of Revelation. <laughs> Surprised, uh, the student said to him, do you understand what it means? And the janitor assured him, oh yes, I sure do. And so the seminary student said, what does it mean? 
And the wise old man quietly said this. It means Jesus is going to win. It means Jesus is going to win. And my friends, I know right now it seems like we're walking on a ball of confusion. It seems like things get more and more difficult, especially for those who are out of work, especially for those who don't have money to make ends meet. And I know our government and charitable organizations are trying to do all they can to help people with food and, and with assistance, but things are very, very bleak, especially for poverty-stricken people, people that don't have income, people uh, that live paycheck to paycheck. And so hopefully the, these words from God's word have been an encouragement to know that God is a very present help in time of trouble. You can turn to him and just lift up your heart to him in prayer and he can do amazing things. Our God is the, that does things that are beyond all that we can ask or think, amazing things. So as we head into a new week here on the Lord's Day, what are some things, what are a few things that as believers in Christ that we could take away from this today? Well, first of all, first of all, in verse 2, I want to remind you of the words, do not fear. What God's saying to you and I there is this, Realize my power. Realize my power. There is no reason for you to be afraid. I've taken care of Israel for thousands of years. They've never been removed from planet Earth, even though there's been hundreds of millions of people surrounding them that want to do just that. And even though Adolf Hitler attempted to do that during World War II, God protected Israel as a nation and sustained it and it continues to prosper to this very day. So we do not have to fear. We can walk through this life knowing God will never leave us and he's powerful and so we don't have to be afraid no matter what the troubles, even if the mountains are carried into the midst of the sea, even though the oceans are roaring, even though there are earthquakes, our God is there. Secondly, I want you to look at verse 8 where it says, Behold the exploits of the Lord. Look at what he has done in the past. Look at what he continues to do in the present and realize his plan. And I told you that that plan is when we spoke of Todd Beamer, I told you that his plan is this. He has a plan for you, a plan for me, a plan for everybody and you will live until God is finished with his plan for you on this earth. That brings amazing comfort. It brings amazing stability. Because we could walk through life and just say, you know what, I don't have to worry about today, about tomorrow, about this year, because God will be with me Till my dying breath and he's there with his power and might and help and sustenance and he'll never leave us or forsake us finally verse 10 another thing so we realize god's power in verse 2 we realize god's plan in verse 8 and in verse 10 we realize god's preeminence if you want to put it in other words we realize god's superiority there's no one like god not even close. And that's why he says in verse 10, be still and know that I am God. Amazing, amazing things that we could take with us this week. God's power, God's plan, and God's preeminence. He's with us. And so Christian friend, rest in the promises of your great, great God. And maybe today you're listening to me and you're saying, Bob, you know what? Uh, thank you for 
telling us about God and thank you for telling us about his power and his care and his provision. But to be honest with you, I don't really understand all of this. To be honest with you, I'm not even really sure if God and I are connected. I'm not really sure, for instance, if I died, if I would be with God forever and ever. I really don't have any idea, or I worry about that all the time. I lay my head on my pillow, and I don't know if I'm going to wake up. If I died that night, I would wake up with God in heaven, or if I wouldn't. Well, I want to just show you three verses just before we pray. And it's in John chapter 11, verses 25 through 27. I'm going to read these very slowly and very carefully. And then I'm just going to put some new slides on the screen. And I'm going to share some truth with you from this. Just for a few more minutes. Martha and Mary, who were friends of Jesus... Their brother, Lazarus, has died, and he's been dead for several days. And of course, Jesus is going there to raise him from the dead and work one of his last miracles on earth. And Jesus is talking to Martha in verse 25, and it says, Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Notice the present tense there, I am. Not I'm going to be. I am, Martha, right now, the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives, whoever is alive and believes in me, shall never die. Do you believe this? Martha said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ. I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Now I'm going to read this slide to you because I want to be very accurate and very careful. But this next slide I wrote out on purpose because I want you to understand what Jesus is saying here. Because Jesus is the resurrection, he says, I am the resurrection. All who believe in him for eternal life and then later die physically have his promise that they shall one day live physically. You'll die physically, but Jesus says, if you'll believe in me, I'll make sure that you won't go into oblivion, that you won't be annihilated. You will die, but you will be resurrected. Though he may die, he shall live. So as the resurrection, Jesus is the cure for physical death. He is the cure for physical death. The reason we don't have to be afraid is in his own person, Jesus is the resurrection. So if you have Christ, you will be resurrected and be with him forever and ever. That's verse 25. Now in verse 26, there is another cure Christ has in store for believers. In verse 26, because Jesus is the life, anyone who is still alive physically... Anyone who is still alive physically here on earth and believes in him for eternal life have his promise that they shall never die. Now you say, Bob, that's really odd. Just if you put your faith in Christ for his gift of eternal life, are you saying I'm never going to die? Well, he's not speaking physically. Obvious, Jesus is referring to spiritual death here. Spiritual death. As the life, he said, I am the life. As the life, Jesus is the cure for spiritual death. In Revelation chapter 20, in the book of Revelation, hell is called the second death. Spiritual death. And he says, if you believe in me, 
for my gift of eternal life, you will never experience spiritual death. Though you die, you will live, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. You will never experience that. You'll never die. So, those who believe will never experience the second death because they have God's life, which is eternal. That's verse 26. Now, finally, in verse 27, Jesus has just given her amazing truths in verses 25 and 26. And in verse 27, Jesus asks Martha, do you believe this? Do you believe this? And she said, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ. I believe that you're the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. And so Martha definitely believed those promises Jesus made. She was telling him, yes, Lord, I believe you. I believe that though I die, I will live because you're the resurrection. And Lord, I also believe you that even though I am alive, I will never die. I'll never experience that second death. And so he is the resurrection and Jesus is the life. And so the final question I just want to leave you with today, just before we pray, is this. Do you know that all is well between you and God today? Do you know that? Do you know that all is well between you and God? You know, the Bible talks about the great white throne in the book of Revelation, and that every person, every person who has died without eternal life, every person who hasn't trusted in Jesus and in him alone, who haven't believed his promises, like the ones we just gave in verses 25 and 26, every person who has ever lived since Adam and Eve, who has rejected that, they will stand before the great white throne. And every single one of those people will be sent away from the presence of God. A very, very sad and a very, very tragic experience, an eternally tragic experience. Because they will live forever outside of God's presence in a place of misery, in a place of ruin. But it doesn't have to be that way. And so today, I so highly encourage you to put your faith in those promises that I shared with you. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I am the life. Whoever believes in me Though he or she dies, he or she will live. Amazing, amazing promise. You'll live forever and ever and ever because Jesus' life is eternal life. And the moment you believe in him for his life, for eternal life, his life becomes yours. And you'll live starting that very moment forever. You're not waiting to get eternal life. You have it the very moment you believe. And so if you're there today and you understand what I've shared with you and you believe it, if you say, Bob, you know what? I believe that. I believe the promises of Jesus. Jesus says to you in his word, you have everlasting life. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we thank you for the gospel of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that millions and millions of people have heard your amazing promises and have taken you at your word. You didn't ask them to sign some kind of spiritual contract. You didn't ask them to make any promises to you. All you asked was that, you, that they would believe you, Lord that they would believe you. And so, Lord, how we pray for people all around this world, Lord, that more and more people, right up to your very return to this earth, Lord, 
more and more and more people would hear this good news and believe it. Because when they do, you give them the free gift of everlasting life. So Lord, I pray for all those who need this, and I pray for all of your people, Lord, that are fighting the good fight. Lord, continue to encourage their hearts through this turmoil. And Lord, help them in all they put their hand to. Take care of them, Lord. Watch over them and provide for them, Lord. And we ask it in the name that's above every name, your name, Jesus, and for your sake.